Now, in part one, we talked about what is Christianity, what it is, what it is not. We talked about how Christianity is represented by many different denominations, each with their own unique doctrines and traditions and rituals, but authentic Christianity is not determined by doctrines and traditions and rituals. But rather, Jesus said, they will know you are my disciples by the love that you have for one another. We sing the song, they will know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Matthew chapter 7 verse 16 says, by their fruits you will know them. By what fruits? By their fruits of doctrine, by their traditions and their rituals, those fruits? No. By their spiritual fruits. And we talked about how the spiritual fruits are found in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. That says that the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control. What is Christianity? Christianity is about how we treat one another in relationship to God. And reflecting the fruit of the Spirit of love and joy and peace and patience. Now I've known some people who call themselves Christian who are not loving. <laughs> Have you ever known any of those? You don't have to raise your hands, please, no names. <laughs> I've known some people who call themselves Christians who might have very strong convictions about doctrines and traditions and rituals, but are lacking the fruit of the spirit of love and joy and peace and patience. In fact, I, I love it that at the heart of Adventism is this desire to be more committed to searching the scriptures to find truth than searching the scriptures to prove what you already believe. Now, I must say that many Seventh-day Adventists have lost that original passion and work harder at trying to prove what they already believe than really searching scriptures to find truth. But at the heart of Adventism, at the origin of the denomination was a commitment to be sola scriptura and to always be searching the scriptures, not just for them to search it back then and then for us to just search the scriptures to prove that they were right, but for us to always be searching scriptures. Now, the third sermon that we talked about, I, I began by looking at righteousness by faith. Now, there's no other starting point than righteousness by faith. That is the most important doctrine of all, righteousness by faith in Jesus Christ, the sacrifice of Christ as our warranty, as our guarantee of salvation is the first and foremost of all the doctrines of Christianity. Without that teaching, all other doctrines would just be mere exercises in futility. The Bible is definitely God's owner's manual. We talked about that in that sermon. It's the owner's manual that God gave for mankind. But thanks be to God that the warranty within that owner's manual is not canceled because we fail to follow and understand everything perfectly. Because see, at our best, at our very best, we still fall short of the regulations and instructions in the owner's manual. However, if we seek to follow the manual, the warranty is sure and certain even if we make mistakes. So today, I want to talk to you about a Sabbath day. As I said in my second sermon, Seventh-day Adventists are not the only ones who worship on the Sabbath. There are actually hundreds of Sabbath-keeping groups if you look on the internet. However, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is without a doubt the largest Sabbath-keeping group in the world. So let me explain by sharing a quotation from one of my favorite authors. His name is Martin Weber. He has written quite a few books, and all of them that I have read I've really enjoyed. He is a Seventh-day Adventist pastor and author and editor. He has served on five different continents and has been in ministry for four decades. In 1994, he wrote this in an Adventist magazine called Elder's Digest. Now listen to this quotation. It's kind of long, but listen. 
Elder Martin said, I believe the Sabbath is the greatest teaching tool of the gospel. It is the brightest of billboards proclaiming Calvary's freedom. Week by week, the seventh day comes around to remind us that we can't save ourselves and we must trust in Jesus. Unfortunately, he says, we Adventists have traditionally presented the Sabbath as an attempt to fulfill the law rather than a rest in the accomplishments of Christ. No wonder fellow Christians who know God's grace have not been overly impressed by Adventist evangelism. Thank God, he said, we are repenting of legalism and beginning to preach the truth as it is in Jesus. He goes on to say, so let us call the world to worship God at Calvary, not at Sinai. Only then can we honor the gospel and complete our gospel commission, end quote. Wow. Elder Weber wrote this 21 years ago. Sadly, I think many Seventh-day Adventists are still presenting the Sabbath as an attempt to fulfill the law rather than a rest in the accomplishments of Jesus Christ. But here is a great opportunity to put the Sabbath in its rightful place. Allow me now to show you what Martin Weber meant when he said, I believe that the Sabbath is the greatest teaching tool of the gospel. It is the brightest of billboards proclaiming Calvary's freedom. In his short article that was titled, Why the Sabbath? Weber talked about how unique Christianity is among other religions in the world. How Hindus and Buddhists have very high moral standards. How Muslims and Jews worship a personal God. How many religions see Jesus as a great leader. But Martin Weber explains how Christianity is unique because in every religion known to man, God, whoever he is and whatever he is, or for that matter, however many gods it is that they worship, in every religion known to man, God is portrayed and salvation in whatever form they may promote is portrayed as very demanding. In other words, no matter what religion someone follows, God has high standards that none of us can meet. In fact, most religions, apart from authentic Christianity, requires some form of a spiritual trek, or they call it a pilgrimage. Unfortunately, there are even some forms of Christianity that urge pilgrimages, but authentic Christianity is the only religion known to man where our Creator is also our Savior, and the pilgrimage is made by Him, not us. Christianity is the only religion where God comes at great expense to himself to show his love for mankind rather than the other way around. Furthermore, authentic Christianity is the only religion in the world where salvation is accomplished for us without us, apart from us. In the same way that creation was accomplished for us and without our help. Creation and salvation is the work of God apart from man. And here is where the seventh day Sabbath comes in. When we look back at the story of the Garden of Eden, we find that after God finished his work of creation, that he rested. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis is real easy to find, isn't it? First book in the Old Testament. Genesis chapter 2. And I want you to just look at verse 1. Genesis chapter 2. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll look at verses um, 1 through 3. Thus the heavens and the earth and all of the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, and because, because in it he rested from all the work which God had made. Wow. Was God tired? Of course God wasn't tired. 
God can't get tired. But he rested because his work of creation was finished. And he invited Adam and Eve to join the celebration of his work. Even though they had done nothing themselves to earn any right to rest. Weber put it this way. This essential meaning of the Sabbath, resting in Christ's accomplishments and not ours, is reinforced by Calvary. On that fatal Friday afternoon, Jesus once again completed work on our behalf. With his dying breath, he cried, It is finished. Mission was accomplished. Listen. Our own feeble accomplishments, our best efforts to keep the law and to uphold doctrines, our own righteousness that the Bible says is like filthy rags cannot impress a holy God. Oh, he, he appreciates sincerity. But his uncompromising law demands a finished work of perfection. And we, we humans are like hamsters on a wheel. Always striving and always moving, but never making it to the top where the law requires us to be. The Sabbath offers us a refuge in the completed work of Jesus from the hamster wheels of our own field accomplishments. Complete in Christ. This is the message of Sabbath. The Sabbath is designed by God to prevent discouragement from spiritual legalism. Week by week, it comforts the conscience, assuring us that despite our unfinished characters, that we are complete in Christ. His accomplishment at Calvary counts for our atonement. This word Sabbath comes from a Hebrew word meaning to cease, to desist, to rest. This is opposite of works. Sabbath is not works-oriented as it is often presented. Sabbath is rest-oriented. Don't misunderstand me. God does not reward indolence or laziness. God has not called us to be spiritual couch potatoes. There is a work to Christian living. It's just that we don't depend on that work for our salvation. On the other hand, genuine faith, true appreciation of salvation by grace leads us to be faithful and obedient. Galatians chapter 3 verse 19 says, what is the purpose of the law? It was added because of sin. In other words, we need the law. We, we, we need the law. We need the law so that we can see what sin really is. And, and not, not just so that we can overcome that sin and, and the problems that are revealed to us, but also so that we can see that no matter how hard we try, that we still fall short and the law shows us that. The Sabbath points us away from ourselves. The Sabbath points us away from our works and forward to rest in God's work for us if we truly see the Sabbath as it was intended to be. Without Sabbath rest, our obedience to God would indeed be legalism. And so why don't all Christians just celebrate the Sabbath? Well, most Christians know that according to the Bible that Saturday is the Sabbath. Most Christians know that. However, most Christians celebrate Sunday as the Lord's Day because Jesus rose on the first day of the week. However, like other Christians, Seventh-day Adventists also celebrate the Lord's Day. Did you know that? We do. We, we celebrate the Lord's Day. Seventh-day Adventists believe that the Lord's Day is very special, so we turn to Scripture to see which day is the Lord's day. And scriptures, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, record only one day as the Lord's day. I would like for you to turn to several passages with me. You're gonna to need to have your spiritual running shoes on. So if you have your Bible, uh, I want you to turn to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, and we're just going to look at verse eight. 
It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of who? The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. What does Sabbath mean? It means a day of rest. Remember we talked about it's not about works. It's about rest. The word Sabbath means rest or cease or desist. The seventh day Sabbath, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall work, but the seventh day is the holy rest day of the Lord your God. Which day is the Lord's day? Which day is the rest day of the Lord? According to this verse, the Sabbath is the Lord's day. Turn to another one, Deuteronomy, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 5, and we're going to begin with verse 14. We'll begin with verse 12. Observe the, the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath, that is, the rest day, of the Lord your God. What day is the day of the Lord? There is no other. So far, we see two references here calling the Sabbath, the Sabbath of the Lord. And Sabbath means a day of rest. Turn to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 58. And we're going to begin looking at verses 13 and 14. I want you to notice in these two verses, listen closely to what this says. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day. What is the holy day of the Lord here? According to this passage, the Sabbath is my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable and shall honor him not doing your own uh, ways or finding your own pleasures or speaking your own words, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord. I will cause you to ride upon the high places of the earth and to feed with the heritage of Jacob. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. The mouth of the Lord has spoken and the mouth of the Lord has said twice, just in verse 13 alone, that the Sabbath, he says, is my holy day and call it the holy day of the Lord. Which day is the Lord's day? According to these verses, so far we've seen five times, five times when the Sabbath is called the Lord's Day. Turn to Matthew. Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. Matthew 12, verse 8 says, For the Son of Man is Lord. Now, some of your Bibles will say, For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. But if you have a Bible that has marks in it that indicate certain things, as mine does, it will say that the word even is just, is just supplied there. It's not there. In other words, in the original Greek, what this verse says is, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Well, you can find that in a couple of other places. But notice what the Bible is saying repeatedly here, is that the Lord's day is Sabbath. These verses also identify which day John the Revelator was likely referring to in Revelation chapter 1 verse 10 when he says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard a loud voice as a trumpet. What day was he likely in the spirit? Well, according to those days, there would have only been one Lord's day and that would have been the Sabbath. There's no other day in all of scripture that is referred to as the Lord's day other than the Seventh-day Sabbath. So like other Christians, Seventh-day Adventists believe that Jesus rose on the first day of the week, as Scripture says. However, here's a very interesting point that most people have probably really never considered. The time, in, in, in the Bible times, the first day of the week did not begin at midnight. You know, we, we begin our days Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Th those days all begin at midnight. We wouldn't even know when midnight was if it wasn't for the fact that we have clocks. But in Bible times, the days didn't begin at midnight. Rather, they began in the evening. As the evening ended, or as the day ended, notice 
Every day of the week began at sundown, not at midnight. Remember in Genesis chapter 1, it says, and the evening and the morning was the first day. And the evening and the morning was the second day. And the evening and morning was the third day, and so on and so forth. Remember also, when Jesus was crucified, the Jews requested that his body be removed from the cross before sundown, because at sundown, the Sabbath would begin. And they didn't want Jesus hanging on the crosses during the Sabbath. Therefore, since we know that Jesus died late on Friday afternoon on what we call Good Friday, and since we know that the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, was about to begin at sundown, then we also know that at sundown on the seventh day of the week, which is called Sabbath, it would end the seventh day of the week and the first day of the week would begin when? At midnight? No, the first day of the week would begin at sundown. Now keep in mind, they didn't call the days of the week Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, etc. The only day that had a name in the Bible times was the seventh day and it was called Sabbath. So the seventh day Sabbath, while Jesus was still in the tomb, when sundown came around, the Sabbath would end and the first day of the week would begin. Notice I said that the first day of the week would begin. I didn't say that Sunday would begin. Sunday doesn't begin until midnight. Sunday wasn't even established for another couple of centuries. Therefore, for us to realize that Jesus rose on the first day of the week would mean that Jesus could have risen early on the first day of the week six hours before it ever became Sunday. Because the first day of the week would have begun, let's say, somewhere around 6 o'clock in the evening. And around 6 a.m. in the following morning, which we call Sunday, Jesus would have risen sometime between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. He may have risen before midnight, which would have been he would have raised before Sunday. In other words, there is a 50-50 chance that Jesus arose early on the first day of the week before what we call today Sunday. Scripture only records when the women came to the tomb. Scripture says early on the first day of the week, just before dawn, or just after it had dawned, or just as it began to dawn, depending upon the, the uh, gospel writer that you're reading, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, each one of them say it differently, but right around dawn is when the women came to the tomb so that it would be light enough for them to see what, what, what is going on. But scripture says that Jesus had already risen before the women arrived. It doesn't say when he rose. He could have risen five minutes ago, but he could have risen 12 hours before then. Therefore, Jesus could have risen sometime after 6 p.m. Saturday night and spent the night in prayer, which was common for him to do before beginning his mission of appearing to his disciples before his, his ascension. If you are a Sabbath keeper, or if you are interested in learning more about celebrating your assurance of salvation by resting in Jesus during the Sabbath, please keep in mind that the Sabbath is about what God has done for us, not what we do for him.